What you're about to watch is a brand new series from Dark Side of the Ring, featuring unanswered questions. He was a drug runner. Story updates from the series creator. She said to us, I've seen my son's killer. Special guests. I can't believe they did that to Bret Hart. And bonus clips from the cutting room floor. I sat on my deck and I cried like a baby, man. All hosted by Conrad Thompson. What the hell do we just watch, guys? <laughs> this is Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. Welcome to Dark Side of the Ring Confidential, coming to you from the former ECW Arena in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Conrad Thompson, and joining me at the table today, the creators of this fine series, Mr. Evan Husney and Jason Eisner. How's it going, guys? It's Great. going well, man. Tonight, we're going to watch alongside of you the Montreal Screwjob episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Plus, we'll reconvene here back at the table. We've got two new perspectives from people who have intimate knowledge of this event. Brett's wife at the time, Julie Hart, will join us and former WWE referee, Michael Chioda. Guys, I'm so excited to talk about Montreal, but I have to ask, this is something that has been discussed to death. What were you hoping to accomplish? Well, we always wanted to make it accessible to non-wrestling fans. And we wanted this episode to be early on in the season so all of those, you know, people who aren't initiated with wrestling terminology and how the backstage politics work, we wanted this to be sort of the entry point for that because this story is really good at sort of setting up who the power players are, what the championship means to these people. Yeah, and the way we kind of treated it too is that it's almost kind of like this Ocean's Eleven style heist for the backstage guys to try and get this belt off Brett somehow. All right, well, let's get to it. Here's Act One of Dark Side of the Ring, the Montreal Screwjob. Brett was amazing. By any standard, Brett may go down as one of the top technicians in the industry. Brett took the business seriously. I think sometimes to his detriment, he took himself a little too seriously. Brett believed he was the WWF champion. On November the 9th, 1997, professional wrestler Brett Hart had fought and clawed his way to the top as world champion. But in a matter of seconds, he would realize that those who make you can just as easily destroy you. Here's the problem. Brett didn't want to lose at the championship. It's your last night in the company. We need to crown a new champion. You know what? We'll just take it from him. It's like I remember when I was a kid exactly where I was standing when John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. And I remember just as precisely where I was when I found out about the Montreal screw job. Screwing a Canadian hero in Canada? How much more evil can one get? <laughs> and I still feel to this day like I have a neon sign on my head. I f***ed you, Brett. Never told you about it, but I f***ed you. And I was so mad, like it just ready to explode. The screw job changed so many things in the business. The innocence of wrestling changed. This was one of the worst things in the world that happened to me in this business. Say what you want about wrestling. That was real. He really screwed that guy. The incident known as the Montreal Screwjob marks a turning point in the history of wrestling. Never before had the curtain been pulled back to fully reveal the behind-the-scenes drama. A dark plot of betrayal was exposed, legacies were redefined, and fans would never see wrestling the same again. It's one thing I always say about the screwjob is that if you go back and you look at all the facts, my story has never changed. It's always been the same story right from day one because I tell the truth. I'm Brett the Hitman Hart, the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. I always say I was a real world champion because I really traveled all around the world and defended my belt. This is my history and my life here, all these guys. Despite everything that's happened with the screwjobs and all that kind of stuff, for me it's mostly happy memories. My name's Jim Cornette. For the past 35 years, I've worked for every major professional wrestling promotion in the United States as a manager, announcer, trainer, matchmaker, pretty much done it all. I was actually there. I actually lived it. I'm giving you my perspective. It's just because my perspective happens to be entertaining that some people take exception to that. I was the executive vice president of talent relations. I've been a writer, producer, director. Brother Love is an alter ego of mine. You name it, worn a lot of hats in the WWF, WWE. The patriarch of the Hart family was Stu Hart. And Stu was a, an age old veteran, double tough. 
The dungeon was the basement in the Hart family house. Well, the dungeon is hard to explain. My dad, 60 or 70 year old man, would go down there and torture a bunch of football players and bodybuilders. I don't feel my arms, sir. Let me uh, show you a hold here. You just take your arm like this. Like you just ease his hand. The Hart family is one of the most famous families in the history of our business. The sons were all wrestlers. The daughters all married wrestlers. They had a wrestling bear that lived under their porch. It was like the Munster's house for the people in Calgary. Stu would invite everybody over and and make breakfast. They had a bunch of cats, and he'd take the thing where he's, he's flipping the eggs, and he'd flip the cat shit over there, and then go back to flipping the eggs, you know. But it made him tough is what it did. And Stu began the uh, Stampede Wrestling promotion in Alberta and had a very successful company there for a long time. Hello, 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 and welcome to this another edition. And Bret Hart was kind of a pale, skinny, you know, maybe 21-year-old kid or whatever. But you could tell he kind of knew what he was doing. And I'm more confident right now than I've ever been. And there's no reason right now that him and me shouldn't have those belts right now. The Hearts were very integral to professional wrestling around the world. In 1984, Stu Hart is trying to keep his struggling territory afloat. The rapidly expanding WWF strikes a deal to acquire the entire promotion, along with Stu's main star, his son, Brett. When Vince bought Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling in 1984, he took Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart, who was the son-in-law, as a team, the Hart Foundation. They were managed by Jimmy Hart, no relation. They were a tremendous tag team, and Bret Hart, had a perfect foil in, in Shawn Michaels. When you have two guys like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels that are as talented as they are at what they do to begin with, and then sometimes there's just chemistry. You find it a duet between two singers that have never worked together before, but suddenly it's a hit. Look at this. Whoa. 360 in midair. Internationally, we're, we're getting reports back that we've got a megastar on our hands in the form of Bret Hart. He, his work had made him this mega star. That was all they wanted to see. That's all they wanted to talk about. And at the same time, Ric Flair was the champion and Rick was having some health issues. We needed to make a change. So Vince is looking at it and going, why not, Brett? That's the kind of guy you want to reward. Vince McMahon's one of the most unique individuals on the planet. If you could cross a genius with P.T. Barnum and Donald Trump, you would get the love child that would be Vince McMahon. Vince, honestly, is a third-generation wrestling promoter. Vince controls creative. Vince controls the talent choices. They run the lunch schedule past Vince McMahon to this day. Over the years, Vince had a good relationship with Brett. I don't know. I, you know, I think that once Brett became champion in Saskatoon, um, th there started, there was a change that was taking place. The criteria for a world champion in those days, there wasn't a set physical list of maneuvers or whatever that you had to perform. It was whoever Vince thought could be the guy. Vince McMahon decides who the champion is going to be. It's not actually won by anybody. So Brett didn't beat Ric Flair. He won the championship in a, in a scripted contest, okay, in, in a storyline. Brett served, you know, to, have that accolade. But at the same time, remember that, that someone made you champion. You didn't really beat anybody. I think Brett looked at the WWF Championship like guys years ago used to. Maybe it was because of his father and his lineage, but when you were chosen to be a champion of a major company, it meant that the promoter thought that you were the best talent, that you were the best draw, that you would make him the most money, that you were the guy. While Brett's star is rising in the WWF, a fledgling promotion suddenly starts edging out Vince McMahon and the television ratings. WCW in the early 90s was a, was a secondary competitor to the WWF. I happened to be Eric Bischoff. You know, as the executive producer, at least I had a voice within WCW. WWF is up here. WCW is way down here. There's no way I can be better than the WWF, but I got to be different than them. Their tape, I'm live. They target their content towards kids. I decided I wanted my characters to be more reality-based. I would use their real names. WCW came after our talent. The perception was they offered them a lot more money. You know, when Hulk Hogan left the WWF, I think it hurt Vince personally. It, it, it stung a little bit. And the first
first, the first big names to go were Scott Hall, Kevin Nash in the very beginning. Ted DiBiase left. Roddy Piper shortly thereafter. The curtain call, as it came to be known, happened because Nash and Hall were leaving to go to WCW for their big contracts. It is my last appearance for the WWE, and it's also Kevin Nash's last appearance. It was at Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world. After the last match, Hall and Nash and Michaels and Hemsley, two of them good guys, two of them bad guys, all went out to the ring and had a big hug and a big kiss and waved bye to the fans who had no idea what was going on. With Sean and those guys, they broke kayfabe in front of the fans in Madison Square Garden. The word kayfabe is like a lot of wrestling terminology. It comes from the days of the carnivals. When you break kayfabe in wrestling, you let the fans and the general public in the inside world and ruin the illusion. It wasn't like that. It all just happened organically because the fans were going crazy. I mean, it was like a magical moment. Here we are 25 years later talking about it. You had been chosen and selected to be in a secret brotherhood and you kept those illusions private and to yourself because that it was a code. It was the code of kayfabe. Now as competition between the two biggest promotions heats up, wrestling's fourth wall starts to crumble, exposing its secrets. And while Brett enters the biggest rivalry of his career, he never could have imagined that it would end up leading to his ultimate destruction. All right, we're back here on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. Guys, there's a lot to unpack in Act One. I'm curious though, Jason, as a Canadian yourself, a kid who grew up in the 90s, what did Bret Hart mean to you as a fan? The Hart family are like royalty in Canada. We've got Wayne Gretzky and then you've got Bret Hart. It may actually go the other way around, Bret Hart and then Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> uh, he was a hero. Everyone I knew growing up, we all thought Bret Hart was like the coolest guy. <laughs> and so when the Montreal screw job happened and in Canada, that was like headline news. Evan, so many of the episodes that you've done for Dark Side tell a cautionary tale of a tragic life. And this is really focusing on one single incident. That's a different challenge, right? Yeah, when I mean, we were actually making season one, we didn't have the name Dark Side of the Ring yet. That was something my mom actually came up with uh, later on. <laughs> we wanted to have a mix of stories about conspiracies, stories about tragedies, but also things that more spoke to the behind the scenes sports side of wrestling. We're just getting started. There's so much more to Dark Side of the Ring, the Montreal screw job. Stay here. We're watching Dark Side of the Ring Confidential, and tonight we're watching alongside you the Montreal screw job. And guys, we've just set the stage before the break. Brett's got a meteoric rise in the WWF. He's going to become the champ and the top guy. And you guys actually got to interview Brett in his house. Yeah, well, first off, it was so cool being in his house. So that was kind of a real, like, just big fan experience. Yeah, going down into his room where he has, like, all his, like, wrestling memorabilia. It was super cool. Yeah. I also remember posters from his Japanese wrestling matches. Yeah, and he walked us through all of it. Well, let's get to it. Act two of the Montreal Screwjob coming up next. Before their off-screen feud would boil over into one of wrestling's most controversial moments, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels' contrasting in-ring styles led to some of the greatest matches of all time. As far as wrestling styles between Brett and Sean, Brett was more basic, more grounded, more hard-hitting, more technical. Michaels from the other side and oh no! Michaels, he's an incredible performer, but also a lot of his stuff is more pretty and a little bit more gymnastic. Oh, he's caught by Brett Hart! Oh, look at that! Oh! I think Shawn Michaels is probably the greatest performer all, all around. Plus, he was different. He, he wasn't a big giant. My contract was going to expire. Eric Bischoff has sent feelers out to me. There were two separate occasions when I began to talk to Brett about coming over. And I heard the initial offer was two million, and then it was two million something, and it got up to like three million. And I'm sure they were rounding off. But at that point, what's the difference, right? Vince heard about them giving me an offer. And then Vince said, he goes, I'll make you an offer. And we worked out a contract. It was 1.5 million for 20 years, I think. Brett favors loyalty over money and accepts the counter offer from Vince McMahon. But then a mutual animosity between Brett and Sean begins to take hold. Sean was starting to get uh, overwhelmed with uh, negative. Doing a Chip and Dale kind of gimmick is not 
a heroic thing to do. Shawn Michaels saw an opportunity to be more and more of a top guy and also to be more and more of a prick. Nobody breaks into this wrestling business to work their way to the middle. I mean, if you don't want to be on top, you're in the wrong business. I don't really care if you want to have dinner with me. Do you want to wrestle me? Oh, you do. Okay. I don't think that they were really that different, which is probably where the real life rivalry came into play. First day when I walked out and I ended up trashing Shawn Michaels on the interview about his Playgirl magazine centerfold. Before I went out, I said, Shawn, I'm gonna, it's okay if I bring up that Playgirl magazine and take a jab at that and say something about it. He was, no, go ahead, say whatever you want. The World Wrestling Federation needs a hero. They need a role model. They need somebody they can look up to. Not somebody that poses for girly magazines. And I came back and Sean was just crushed. He, he almost looked like he burst, burst into tears. Now, now we're doing live TV and these guys are saying things on live TV about each other. Sean made reference to sunny days. Sonny is uh, Tammy Sitt. She was one of the valets. She was the first real, you know, big pinup girl of the WWF. And Sean was making the inference that Brett was having some kind of an affair or some, some kind of relationship with Sonny. Even though lately you've had some sunny days, my friend, you still can't get the job done in any situation. Oh boy. Now, from a fan's point of view, it's getting exciting. But if you're the other guy, you're hating the dude who's talking about you. Because now you got to call, call home and explain that to your wife. You don't mess with a guy's wife or his family, or else why you find yourself laying in a ditch somewhere. So we're in Hartford, Connecticut one night at the Hartford Civic Center. And all of a sudden, the door busts open, and in comes the Brooklyn Brawler. And he says, hey, Vince, Sean and Brett have just gotten a fight in the bathroom. Sean finally comes into my dressing room. We haven't talked for about a couple months. I just remember I was just trying to be nice. I almost like forgot that we ever had issues. I said, hey, Sean, I was brushing my hair. And he goes, you think I'm going to talk to you? And whatever it was, Brett just leg dived him and took him down right there. So I grabbed him by the hair and swung him around the dressing room. I think his feet were actually off the ground a couple of times. I think it was like two prostitutes fighting in downtown or something. Here comes Sean, and he's hot. And he has got in his hand a handful of his hair. It looked like a small possum. And I'll never forget this. He said, this is an unsafe working environment. As far as I know, I think if anybody was sleeping with Sonny, it probably was Sean. <laughs> as the backstage friction between Brett and Sean intensifies, Vince begins to lose the TV ratings war and is forced to cut costs. Vince comes back and looks at the commitment that he had made to Bret Hart, and it was it was a drain. It was a drain on the company for what we were bringing in at the time. Vince told me that basically he couldn't afford to pay me the contract that he'd given me. It kind of broke my heart. Like where I was like, okay, I get it. I remember I got off the phone from him and I said, I guess I'm I'm done. I hung up with Vince and I signed my WCW contract. I can't remember exactly what day or when I heard that that. Brett had made the deal and was going to WCW, but Vince told us Brett was going to finish up at Survivor Series. He'd drop the belt and and then he'd, you know, he'd be free. It didn't turn out that way. With Brett leaving the company, Brett wasn't just leaving the company. He was leaving the company and going to our competitor that was beating us in the ratings. To have our champion leave the company is bad enough. To have them leave the company with the championship is a kick in the nuts. The time-honored tradition is when you're leaving a territory or a promotion, you lose on the way out. I gotta tell you, in the, in the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of worry about it because it was Brett. And we thought that, that there would not be any issue with Brett dropping the championship to whoever we asked him to drop the championship to. When I first heard that I was wrestling Sean was maybe about three or four weeks before Survivor Series. Anyway, so Vince pulled me and he goes, he's all excited, he goes, we're gonna drop the belt to Sean. So when I saw Sean, I, I, I thought this is your chance to open the door for sort of dialogue. So I remember when we shook hands, I said, uh, Sean, I just heard that we're wrestling at Survivor Series. I said, I want you to know that you'll always be safe with me in the ring, that I'll always be professional. I would never do anything to hurt you or injure you or anything like that. And he looked at me and he said, he goes, I appreciate that but I just want you to know that I am not willing to do the same thing for you. And he turned around and walked out of the dressroom and slammed the door. Vince, 
Even though he knew that Sean and Brett hated each other, somehow he thought this match was magically gonna go in the ring and everything was gonna work out like he wanted. And the closer that we got to the match, the more obvious it was that it was not. One of the things he had given Brett in that brand new contract with all the bells and whistles was reasonable creative control of his character and the way he was presented. I'm the boss of my last 60 days. Why would I lose to Sean? He's disrespected me. I'm not wrestling Sean, or I don't, I'm not putting Sean over under any circumstances until he proves me that he's got enough respect for me to put me over first. And I was on Brett's side, because Sean was the prick, not Brett, but we had to get the belt back. The news of Vince's current champion signing with his main competitor would spell his defeat in the ratings war. With his back to the wall, Vince must get his belt off Brett, and what he's about to do will echo far beyond the wrestling world. All right, we're back here on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential, and we're watching things heat up in 1997. It's all about Bret Hart's feud with Shawn Michaels. And we're gonna hear from Bret in this episode, but we didn't hear from Shawn. Did you guys attempt to get Shawn on camera? It was always our intention when we started planning out this episode to get them both. When you have two opposing viewpoints that are kind of in contrast, and we really wanted to have that in, in the episode. I actually remember being at a convention, waiting in line. <laughs> I was getting somebody an autograph, for Shawn Michaels, I was gonna drop it like, hey, we're working on this thing, you know? So I get up to the front of the line, it took me forever, I was waiting there all day. And I was like, we're doing this uh, documentary for Vice, it's about the screw job, and we'd love to talk to you about it, you know, just like jumbling it all out. And he's like, talk to him. Shawn just like rushed me off to some other handler or manager or whatever, and I pitched it to him, and then we kind of waited around, and then we got word that Sean doesn't want to participate. He said everything that he's had to say. That was pretty much it. We tried to in include as much of that side of the story as we could, but ultimately it's more about Brett. The story of the Montreal screw job is just getting started up next. We'll see how the deed got done on Dark Side of the Ring, the Montreal screw job. I'm Conrad Thompson, and you're watching Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. Guys, before the break, we saw some pretty hurt feelings about Brett potentially leaving the WWF for WCW. But I think it's important to note, this all comes out of Vince not honoring his contract, right? I agree. I think that's a very underrated aspect of this story. Here's a guy who, for all intents and purposes, would want to stay with WWF. That's on the 20-year deal. Exactly. He sees himself there. His family has such a long history with the McMahons. You know, I think that's where he'd want to wind up. So Vince not honoring the deal at the end of the day is the catalyst to the situation that we get into. All right, coming up, we'll see exactly how the Montreal screw job went down. Keep it here. With his last match in the WWF less than 24 hours away, Bret Hart is refusing any scenario which has him losing the belt to his real-life nemesis, Shawn Michaels. Bret is growing suspicious of what his boss, Vince McMahon, might do. Showed up that day and I was ready for my match. But I did have suspicions about the referee. I, mean, I remember thinking the only way they can screw me, is Sean will never pin me or tap, make me tap out. So I wasn't worried about that. I said, but the way it'll work is they'll get the referee. Hello, I'm Roy Hebner. I'm a referee. My relationship with, with Brett was great. Most of the time, he always wanted me to ref his matches. People think, oh, I can count to three and it's over. That's, that's not the ball game. We are sort of a coach. You're thinking for three people. It's uh, very, very hard. Okay, so let's get into the, to the Montreal story. Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> the day before that show, I got on the plane, got in my seat. The stewardess came back and said, uh, Mr. Hebner, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, you have a first class seat. I said, my ticket don't say first class. She said, Mr. Hart bought you a first class seat. So I went on up here, Seppi Brett. And we, looked, we talked, and uh, Brett said, uh, will you promise me one thing? I said, what's that? He said, you won't count me out? I said, nope, I will not count you out. I said, you know they're gonna ask you to screw me tomorrow. But he got the tears in his eyes, and he got his lip quivering, and he was like, the hell with that eyes for I swear to God on my kids, I would never, you know, and he was so adamant, and there I shook his hand, and I said, just tell me if something like that's gonna happen. Complicating matters. A film crew producing a documentary called Wrestling with Shadows is following Brett to capture his last WWF match. From the second I land, I got the entire um, High Roads production film crew. They're filming, and they got the boom mics and the whole thing, and they follow me where I went. It was like uh, 
a lot of people that I didn't even know all around the building. The idea was that Vince would get with Brett. I think that Vince felt that once he got in front of Brett face to face, that they would work something out. But I remember um, the whole camera crew come in, like they wanted to mic me up and everyone. Nah, I kind of don't. It's not how I operate. He goes, just in case. My name is Harry Zafrani. I was the sound recordist on uh, Wrestling with Shadows. The director told us, look, we got to be very low profile about this. You know, nobody should know that Bret Hart is, is wired. It was a private meeting, and Bret went in wired. Didn't let Vince know that he was recording it. I never ever wanted to leave here with any kind of bad feeling. But this week has been a bad week for me. I feel kind of betrayed a little bit. The way this whole thing has been depicted, it's really hard for me as a hero here to come up short. I was determined to, to, to stick to my guns, and that I was not backing down. And right away, Vince goes, well, what are we going to do? I think what I'd like to do is get through today. I think tomorrow I should just go in and do my speech and forfeit the title. I think it allows me a chance to leave with my head up and leave in a nice way. I, I would think it'd be a run-in type thing. But, yeah. But I'm open to No, I think that's... I'm open anyway. Going into this match, you knew what what was going to happen. I knew that there was a point in the match where Bulldog and Owen would run out, referee would lose control of the match, ring the bell, there would be no winner, and we would go off with a lot of chaos going on in the ring. So the match would end in like a disqualification? Yeah, like basically a no contest. Like I remember walking out to the ring, and I knew like, okay, be leery of um, submission holds in a match like this. But I already talked to Earl, and I thought about it, and it's like, I said, okay. I trusted Earl, and so I put my guard down. That was, the, that was my um, fatal mistake. I'm walking down to go to the ring, and I'm getting pulled aside. And Jerry Briscoe says, Vince McMahon wants you to ring the bell when he puts Brett in the sharpshooter. I said, what? He said, well, are you going to do it? I said, I don't know. Jerry Briscoe is a producer agent, one of the toughest son bitches on the face of the earth. He grabs you by the arm. He says, is Bret Hart going to pay you? This is what Vince wants. Do you want a job or not? I said, I don't have an idea of what I'm going to do right now. Y'all messed my mind up. And this is the truth. I'm thinking he had opportunity to drop the bill. I know this is not right, but I got to have a job. I told my brother to put all my shit in the car. This ain't gonna look good, get all my shit out the dressing room, put it in the car. So I'm walking to the ring. God, I promised Brett I wouldn't count him out. That was the longest walk of my life. We had a great match planned out, and Sean was a great wrestler. We're gonna start fighting before the bell starts. I don't, I don't think this match has officially even started. Finally, after about 10 minutes of brawling out and fighting out in the crowd and stuff, I eventually fight Sean back to the ring, throw him in the ring, and now the match starts. They get in the ring, ring, I ring the bell to start, and I'm going, God, <laughs> don't put the sharpshooter on. The match lasts 10, 15 minutes. Look at this! Oh, putting Brett in the sharpshooter. Oh my gosh, how humiliating. He's going to beat him with his own finish. Sean actually didn't know how to put the sharpshooter on. He steps through the wrong way, folds my legs the wrong way, and I moved my legs and switched them the right way. I remember when he put it on, I flipped over, I could see Vince McMahon, and I could see him, he's got this cold look on his chest, and he's yelling at it to ring the f***ing bell. Ring the bell, and he kept saying it to the guy, ring the bell. As the match was going on, I'm going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I hated it. And I remember in that moment of looking at the timekeeper, and Vince snaps at him, ring the f***ing bell. Oh, they're screwing me right now, and I remember, reaching back and showing that I wasn't submitting, and I grabbed Sean's leg and started to reverse, but you could hear the bell ding, ding, ding. If I hadn't rung the bell, Vince McMahon was gonna ring that bell. And at first I was like, I wanted to just kill Vince. I wanted to just jump through the ropes and just punch him out. I couldn't believe he did it to me after all the years that I gave him and all the matches and all the hard work and he would disrespect me like that. You son of a bitch. I jumped out of the ring, ran across the floor, jumped the hockey fence, and could still hear the bell ringing, jumped in the car, and we drove off. I had enough sense to paint WCW backwards so that you could read it on TV. Brett did the WCW for the fans there in Montreal, but it was, you know, it was what it was. I remember I had a nice good gobber spit, and I remember I just leaned over the top rope. Hollywood couldn't recreate something better than that. I wrecked a bunch of monitors and threw $100,000 headphones out into the crowd and stuff. 
because of a couple of guys who couldn't get along, they hit on the most talked about match ending in the history of professional wrestling since the dawn of time. Widely viewed by fans as wrestling's most treacherous act, the Montreal Screwjob would tear the lid off of wrestling's sacred brotherhood. But its true architect has yet to be revealed. Conrad Thompson here back with you on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. And guys, it finally happened. The deed went down, the Montreal Screwjob. I do have a question though. How and why did we interview the sound guy from Wrestling with Shadows? This was probably one of the more surreal things we came across while making the show. <laughs> while we were in Montreal doing an episode about the murder of Dino Bravo, Vice had hooked us up with a sound recordist there. He's talking to us about wrestling. He's hearing we're doing a wrestling show. And he was like, oh, one time I was part of a wrestling documentary. And he was like, um, something like Wrestling with Shadows? What? Were you there at the night of the screw job? And he's like, yeah, I was right by the ring. And we were like, are you kidding us? <laughs> he tells us this story about how like the director of Wrestling with Shadows came up to him and wanted to be very covert about putting this microphone on Brett for when he goes into this meeting with Vince. In case anything and, happens, there's a record of it. Yeah, and the, one of the crazier things about it was that Harry didn't even watch the documentary. He's never seen it. And we were like, dude, as soon as we're done filming these interviews for Dino Bravo today, you gotta go home and watch this documentary. And if you're down with it, let us interview you about it. So he goes home, he watches Wrestling With Shadows, and he comes back in a panic the next day. And he's like, oh my God, they screwed Brett? You know, and now he's like all up to speed on everything. And so when he told us that he was there that night, it blew our minds, couldn't believe it. Fascinating stuff, guys. Well, coming up, we're gonna hear from former WWE referee Mike Chioda. He's got a perspective you've never heard before about what was supposed to happen the night of the Montreal Screwjob. It's next on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. All right, we're back here on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. I'm your host, Conrad Thompson. Joining me at the table, the creators of the series, Evan and Jason. We just heard from head referee Earl Hebner as far as his account of what happened that night in the ring at the Montreal Screwjob. But that wasn't the original plan, at least according to our next guest, former WWE referee Mike Kyoto joins us now. How's it going, Mike? Welcome to the show. Man, good to hear from you, Conrad. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Let's jump right into it. What was your side of the Montreal Screwjob story? All day, there was just a lot of tension, a lot of vibes. It was something that was weird, something was going on. Brett knew something might go on. My role in that match was to come down on a bump that Earl was supposed to be he took, and I was supposed to count one, two, and then Owen was right behind me, and he shit hands me out the ring, picks me up on my back of my shirt, and my belt buckle, and just tosses me right through the second and third row. But obviously, that never happened. And I was sitting there backstage while Earl took the bump, and then all of a sudden, they hear the bell, I look over to Jerry Briscoe, he was gone from Gorilla. Like he was supposed to send me, but that never happened because Jerry was on his way out to ringside. And as I'm looking through the curtain, no one's going, what the is going on? And I said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then uh, I'm, I'm watching Earl running through the bomb, through the crowd, over the hockey boards. Earlier, because Jimbo had that earlier, uh, before the match, right before the match, he goes, hey, what's going on in this match? So I have no idea, I said, I have one spot. I come in, I count two, get thrown out by Owen, and Owen turns around and gets super kicked. He's out of the picture. That's what we knew, what was going on. Of course, everything was pretty much a complete lie at the end of that for that finish. So, and that's why nothing went down the way it was supposed to be planned on my part. That was planned out for me and Owen. But then, you know, you put two and two together, and that's why everything was like that. So that's why the finish went down like it did. I believe, you know, Brett got screwed. He got lied to. So you feel bad for what happened to Brett, right? It was kind of hard because Brett was a good friend of mine. He was a good family man. Him and Sean didn't have a lot of respect for each other. It was two top talent guys. And Vince and the, and the company seen Sean Michael as their superstar at that time. So they knew Sean was going to be the future of the company. My point, I just didn't know why there wasn't room for Brett Hart and Sean Michaels in the company, but... Those two egos didn't get together, those two, two personalities. In this episode, we hear from Earl and how difficult this decision was for him and how it's impacted his life. As a fellow referee, let's say you were in this position and this happened to you, what would you do? You know what? 
I would have had to do the same thing. I really would have. I would have had to do the same thing to feed my family because you would have been on the streets out on the outside looking in if you didn't do it that you were told. Why do you think, like, to this day, people are still so fascinated in the Montreal screw job? In somebody's career like that, even myself, I felt bad watching it over and over. You know, when Brett came out of that sharpshooter and he was just like, what is going on? You got to be kidding me. They really did this to me. They did it. Hearing and seeing all the things that you saw, what do you think of people that think Brett was in on it? No, no, Brett wasn't in on that. No, there was no way. I don't think Brett was in on that one bit, you know, because he, he had so much passion for this business. And I think that the heat that he had with Shawn Michaels personally, I think he would have dropped the strap anywhere else, the title, but not in Montreal that night. Yeah, any other memories from that day? I remember Earl Hebner, when I was supposed to do my spot, Earl Hebner never came up to me that day and, and it said like, hey, are you gonna be there for your spot? Make sure you come down, make sure you do this. You know, when I take the bump, do this, do that. Earl never got with me that. And then there is one thing I'd like to add, because I remember before the match, Jerry Briscoe had pulled over Earl. They went kind of under the bleachers. I was getting ready to walk over there thinking, are they talking about a certain spot or should I be involved in that? And then I kind of knew something's, something's happening here. I just didn't know. I mean, they left me out of the loop completely, that's for sure. And thank God they did. I didn't want to be involved in that match, screwing somebody over like Brett the MN Hart. What was running through your mind as this was unfolding? Holy shit, I can't believe they did that to Bret Hart. Wow, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you sharing this with us. You got it, man, no problem. Thank you for having me. Of course, thanks. Take care, Mike. All right, you too, thank you, bye-bye. See ya. That's fascinating stuff. Well, big thanks to Mike Kyoto. Well, we're gonna keep talking all things Montreal Screwjob coming up next. The following includes exclusive commentary from the show's producer and director. This commentary is unrehearsed, may contain controversial statements, and reflects the opinions of the people speaking and not Vice TV. Dark Side of the Ring Confidential is back, and we're right smack dab in the middle of watching the Montreal screw job. Guys, the Bret Hart stuff is super compelling, but I am curious, he's told this story a hundred times. Why was he interested in sharing his story with you? We had just come off of making this story about Bruiser Brody, and we talked to it, Bruiser Brody's family, and we got deep into investigating the circumstances of his death, and then he was just like, immediately heard that, and that was like, to him, Brody meant so much. It was almost like, well, if they're doing a story on Brody, then this might be legit. That was it, that's all he needed to hear. Well, let's get to the real drama. Let's see the aftermath of what happened when Earl Hebner called for the bell at Survivor Series 1997 it's the Montreal Screwjob. Let's watch. This is where I've told a couple of these things. I've never gone this far, but I figured, like I said, I'm not going to talk about this on TV anytime in the rest of my life, so I guess at this point I don't care who gets mad at me. So it was me and Vince Russo at Vince McMahon's house. My name is Vince Russo. I was the head writer at the WWE during the infamous Montreal Screwjob. And quite honestly, um, I wasn't even originally slated for this documentary. And then I wanted to be a part of it because I was there. Like, I knew what went, would happen. So I'm sitting there that day. First, Vince gets up and he takes phone call from Brett. What I could tell you about that phone call is, you know, Vince pitched many different scenarios for Shawn Michaels to take the belt off of Bret Hart. And Bret soured on every single one of them. Vince told Brett we'd go back to the drawing board, and that's exactly what we did. Well, this finish won't work, and that finish won't work, and Brett just wants to come out and hand the belt over on TV the following night without getting beat. I'm sure he does. So then he goes and he calls Sean. Every time Vince goes in there, then I sit in a room twiddling my thumbs with the guy that I hate worse than anybody in the world, Vince Russo. We'd get in these creative meetings, and the three of us would argue. And, and it wasn't the three of us, it was Jim and me. We could not be farther apart physically, philosophically, mentally, morally. If one of us was an African-American lesbian nun and the other was a Nazi skinhead Martian from outer space, we could not be more different. The problem is he's still living in 1970. I'll never forget he made the comment, oh, when a guy comes out of a box, he's instantly over. 
Like, bro, this is like 1996. Like, who's coming out of boxes, bro? Vince Russo's never had any respect for professional wrestling. He booked the wrestling program to pattern after Jerry Springer. Our styles completely crash. Finally, Vince comes out, and I'm about lost my religion with the whole creative team thing anyway, because it's not my style of wrestling. I'm living in Connecticut. I'm miserable. I weigh 280 pounds because I'm aggravation eating. I'm just, I, I'm not in my element here. I said, Vince, I said, there's got to be something we can do. I said, it's your company and it's your belt. So then Vince looks at me and says, well, then how would you do it, pal? Well, now it's a challenge. Once again, I'm going through every finish I can think of or every situation I can ever think of where nobody wanted to do a job. I said, goddamn, double crossing. You can learn more about modern wrestling from these classic books and classic magazines than you can by talking to people today because history always repeats itself. In 1931, there was another double cross in Montreal, the Battle of the Bite. Strangler Lewis controlled the championship and nobody could get it away from him because it was worth so much money. Lewis has a title match in Montreal against Henri de Glane, Henry de Glane. They lock up and immediately DeGlaine grabs Lewis's own hold on Lewis, the headlock, and takes him down and they go down on the mat because Lewis is working with him and, they, and probably they're gonna do some kind of reversal. DeGlaine starts screaming bloody murder at the top of his lungs. The referee checks DeGlaine. Huge bite mark on the guy's chest. Apparently, when DeGlaine got the headlock on Lewis, Lewis had bitten him. Here's the thing, it was actually Dan Kolov, DeGlaine's corner man had bitten him in the locker room and then did this, and then when they locked up, boom, headlock, nobody can see what happened. Referee disqualifies Strangler Lewis and awards the title to Henri DeGlaine. That's a double cross, and it's as old as the hills in wrestling. So when Vince says, well, how would you do it then? Brett's hold is the sharpshooter. But let Sean get Brett's hold on him, if the referee just calls for the bell as a submission, nobody can tell anything was wrong because that's what it's supposed to look like anyway. And to tell anybody anything was wrong, I said, Bret Hart, of all people, would have to expose the business. I said, what's he gonna do, call the newspapers? But then Vince, nah. And he gave that humph like he does when, whenever you would be discussing tomfoolery and he would say, all right, let's get back to reality. And we went on. Do you recall during that meeting with Vince and Cornette, Cornette ever told a history lesson about double crosses that had happened in the past? Unless I was in the bathroom during that scenario, that scenario did not take place in front of me when I was sitting at the table. I'm not gonna call Jim Cornette a liar. And when I was sitting at the table and Cornette was sitting at the same table, I pitched that exact scenario to Vince. So basically out of pure frustration, I said, Vince, I said, screw it, Vince. Have Sean put the sharpshooter on Brett and have the referee call for the bell. Do that. Vince Russo didn't know what a double cross was. He was sitting there with his eyes open. People tell me all the time, oh, Vince, you 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 take credit for the Montreal Screwjob. I wish I didn't pitch the idea. That was a miserable night. It was one of the worst experiences in my life in the wrestling business. I swear on my mother's grave, my father's grave, my wife's life, and my dog's life. The story I just told you is true. Vince Russo is the biggest liar in professional wrestling, and imagine the territory that takes in. When I was sitting there at the monitor, I saw him going to the spot. That's when I shit myself. Holy f he's actually going to do this. And look to this, look right now. Close up on the goosebumps. Now I'm thinking, I don't know who else knows about this. I just know that there is a high probability that somebody in this building is going to want to beat the shit out of me in the next 10 minutes, and I'm going to get out of here. When I'm starting my car up and starting to pull out, I heard a car rev the motor and saw the headlights pop up behind me. That had to be Hebner. <laughs> I beat him out of the building. Welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. Guys, we just heard Jim Cornette mention Earl Hebner again. I can't help but think, Earl Hebner is kind of a tragic figure in all this. Yeah, he is still haunted by this, as you can obviously see. He still has to look over his shoulder. And when he 
heard that we were a bunch of Canadians coming down to do to interview him about the Montreal screw job, there was a thought in his mind that we were Canadians coming down to seek revenge for his involvement in the Montreal screw job. There was like this vibe that was off with him. Yeah, he was like pacing around in the parking lot. And then about like, I don't know, half an hour, just as they were getting set up and finishing it, and he's sitting down, he's like, I just gotta be honest with you guys. I was like, what's up? And he's like, I thought y'all were gonna kill me. And then he actually showed us the text messages that he was sending his wife, like, no, these guys are cool, it's okay. I, I can't believe this is real, but I think we have a clip of this. Let's take a look. Oh, something's not wrong. I said, I don't feel comfortable about this thing. And honest to God, I started to call, I got a buddy on the police force. I started to get him to come down here and let him knock on the door so if a bullet came through the door, to shoot him and not me. I really uh, didn't know if this was a setup or what. And Howard, the way you started out made it look like a setup that you wanted to kill my ass. I thought you guys were ribbing me. He's the one that's had to live with the consequences of this for so long. Like his fans, you know, always are chanting, you screwed Brett, you screwed Brett, anywhere he goes. Fascinating. Coming up next, it's the fallout from the Montreal screw job. Keep it here. Dark Side of the Ring Confidential is back. Before the break, we saw a little bit about Vince Russo and his relationship with Jim Cornette. So how does Russo find his way into the story? <laughs> we originally were interviewing Vince Russo for the Brawl for All episode. And while we were doing that, he heard us talking about that we were gonna do an episode about the Montreal screw job. And he kind of like stopped us and said, guys, if you're doing a story about the Montreal screw job, I gotta get in on that, cause I was there. You gotta talk to me. I mean, I know everything that happened, bro. It was my idea, bro. It's so surreal. The story of the Montreal screw job is next, and we're gonna hear those messy details of when the hitman put one on the chin of Vince McMahon. It's coming up on Dark Side of the Ring, the Montreal screw job. Just as Bret Hart was double-crossed on live television by his boss, Vince McMahon, WWF executive Bruce Pritchard is blindsided himself by the sudden change in plans. So it's chaos. I'm not even realizing what's happening in front of me. How did you feel about not being involved in the... Oh, God, I was pissed off that I wasn't smart enough as to what they were doing. And I was pissed off because I was left in the back, alone, in a position where everyone thought they knew that I was involved. And I wasn't. I felt very alone. I felt betrayed. That piece of shit's locked himself in his office. Cameras are off. Show's over. I got screwed. And I was so mad. And there's Sean suddenly in my dressing room. He's swearing to God that he had nothing to do with it. Sean, you weren't in on that? My hands are clean this one, I swear to God. He was a bad actor. But one of the two was in on it that I think. Sean had to be in on it. You know, at that time, I, I had no idea. Well, now we know Sean was just putting on an app. It was like this hush in the dressing room. Everyone was kind of stunned. I remember Undertaker got so mad that he kicked over one of those big steel barrels. He just slammed the door and said something about uh, he was going down to Vince's office to get a straight answer on why they did that to me. You know, Vince, you, you got to go over and, and talk to him, explain why you did what you did. You got to give him one. And by giving him one, let, if he's going he's gonna to hit you, you got to take one. Brett came out of the shower and told Vince, get out of his dressing room. And then he said, he goes, he says, if you're still here when I get out, I'm gonna get dressed, I'm gonna punch you out. Brett finished his shower. I mean, he went back and <laughs> took his sweet ass time and finished his shower. And Vince stood right in the middle of the room waiting for him to finish. So I finished shower and I come out, and it's funny because I walk out of the shower sopping wet, naked. Vince said something to me along the lines of, this is the first time I ever had to lie to one of my talent, which is such a lie. I remember tying my shoes and I remember when I got tied my last shoelace, I started to tie it and I go, well, this is it. I'm gonna punch out Vince McMahon. I can't believe I'm doing this. And we walk towards each other, end up tying up, just like a pro wrestling match. And I remember just sinking down and kind of just turning my whole body and thinking 14 years and coming up right between our arms. And I hit Vince McMahon with the most beautiful Mike Tyson uppercut. I popped him literally off the, right off the ground he went straight down, out cold. Everybody was stunned. No one could believe it. It was dead silent for a while, and nobody said anything, and then Brett said, get the out of my dressing room. I mean, I have to say that I remember Shawn Michaels. 
he was bawling his eyes out like a baby. And I remember thinking, I know you were in on it. And he knew it. He was like waiting for me to make my way over to him and finish him off. And I, I just tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Sean, thanks for the match. Or he couldn't believe that I thanked him for the match. And then he looked up at me and he just burst into tears, like really blubbering. Like, I had never to that point heard of that much drama and backstage just bullshit. Sometimes I lost sleep over what I should have done that day. Brett, you're not going to understand this now, but Vince was trying to protect his business. It was never about not trusting you. He didn't trust Eric. I went in Vince's office and said, I need to talk to you. He said, okay. I said, I'm He said, I got a meeting with everybody today. We'll take care of it. Set everybody down and said, what I did last night was my call. It's not Earl's fault and anybody don't like it can come to my office and I'll release your ass right now. The screw job was already in the makings. They had to find somebody that would do it. The conversation I had with Vince where, where we really had the big heart to heart was the following Wednesday in Stanford. And I told him what I thought. Vince's reaction was, if you had known, then you would have known. You would never be able to say that you didn't know. Shawn Michaels risked everything for you and for this company. So before you condemn Shawn Michaels, understand what he did for you and your family. There were a lot of what if scenarios discussed the night before. And I think that everybody believed that at the end of the day, Vince was going to be able to convince Brett to drop the championship. That didn't happen. So Vince asked uh, Jerry Briscoe to let Sean know there's a spot in the match uh, that Sean, when you get him in the, in the sharpshooter, will ring the bell. <laughs> of all people, Bret Hart, who was raised in the wrestling business, whose father was a wrestler, who went through the code, he's the one that exposed the business. So we're talking with Bret Hart, the hitman today. How are you? It was very important to me after 14 years of uh, probably the most dedicated, loyal, hardworking service that you could ever get out of a professional wrestler. I'd given this man everything you could ever ask for, and I made it very, very clear that my character was not in any way, shape, or form going to be humiliated. Brett was telling any and everybody that he could. He didn't lose. He was screwed. And it was something that Vince felt it was important to address on Monday Night Raw. Did you or did you not screw Bret Hart? There's a time-honored tradition in the wrestling business that when someone is leaving, they show the right amount of respect. And the people are like, no, we don't want to like the rich billionaire boss. We liked Bret Hart. He was our hero. Bret Hart didn't want to honor that tradition. Vince was really giving Bret Hart all kinds of shit for not honoring the time-honored tradition of doing the right thing on the way out on TV. This didn't happen ever before. Vince, in this interview, just came across very cold, calculated, and very, very heelish. I truly believe that Bret Hart screwed Bret Hart. And you can look in the mirror and know that. Rather than sweep this incident under the rug, Vince capitalizes on it by transforming this real life incident into a storyline where he reinvents himself as an evil, conniving mastermind. When I debuted, the fans didn't know that Vince was the owner. He was an announcer. And then once the word got out that he actually owns the company, He's the power behind the throne, this and that. Vince ran with it. Mr. McMahon is one of the greatest heel characters of all time, yes. I mean, you've heard arenas full of people chant, asshole, asshole. If they had done it right, everybody prospered. Shawn Michaels became the WWF champion off a big win. Vince McMahon became the catalyst to the evil empire, Mr. McMahon, and they handed the hottest wrestler in the world, Bret Hart, to WCW, and they dropped that ball. Welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. As they say in the wrestling business, that was such good shit. Bret really enjoys retelling that story of punching Vince McMahon. Did that come through when you were there filming? Absolutely. I like how he winds up and he's just like, 14 years. You can really tell him. He's pissed. When we're telling these stories, it's like we're always looking for those things you can reenact. So anytime a wrestler's telling these stories, we're all, we're like nudging each other like, well, that's going to be something. Yeah, it's one of the more like infamous stories about Vince McMahon. All right, guys, I want to remind everybody, stick around at the end of this episode. We're going to bring it back to the table to discuss more of these unanswered questions with some more bonus discussion. We'll also hear from someone who has intimate knowledge of that night and Bret Hart, Bret's first wife, Julie Hart. So stick around for that. But right now, 
It's time for the conclusion of the Montreal screw job. Welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. And guys, before the break, we heard Vince utter that famous line, Bret Hart screwed Bret Hart. Where did you land on this? Did Bret screw Bret or did Vince screw Bret? It's kind of going back to what we were saying earlier. If you're talking about how Vince didn't honor parts of Bret's original contract, that's a little Vince screwed Bret, in my opinion. I agree. Like, I think that Vince should have been transparent with him. But then in the same token, as a fan looking at it, you're sort of like, if this didn't happen, then what would have happened to the wrestling business? Because shortly after that, as we know, Vince McMahon becomes this huge villain character in the WWF universe, which launches into Stone Cold Steve Austin, the Attitude Era, wrestling becomes the hottest thing in the world. It's a fascinating business. Guys, stick around. At the end of tonight's episode, we've got a very special bonus clip. But right now, let's get to the conclusion of the Montreal Screwjob. In the aftermath of the Montreal Screwjob, wrestling changed forever. The fourth wall had fallen. Vince McMahon's villainous character would propel his company into the stratosphere while Bret Hart would make his lackluster debut in WCW. You know, if you look at how Bret Hart even came to WCW and how I, God, they launched me the very first day. Why don't we bring the man out that's going to referee this match? God, I remember, like, referee is so lame, like, such a lame way to bring me in. Is that what you want? Referee. Eric Bischoff was an imbecile trying to run wrestling. He didn't have any idea about how to run wrestling. I have to take some responsibility in the fact that there may have been better ways to bring Brett in. I would be honored to be the referee. But at the same time, we'll never know that because the plans that we did have for Brett were executed so piss poorly because of his just detachment from it all. He didn't get over in WCW. Zero impact. Hey, Bischoff! At the WCW, I quit. I think the legacy of the Montreal Screwjob is that nobody knows if it was really a screwjob or not. I happen to believe it was the real deal. To me, I feel the same way now seeing it back as I did the first time I thought, saw it as a total work. Everybody was in on it, and they all did it together. Now look at Brett's face. He doesn't look too shocked to me. You're going to spit on Vince, and then the, the truck is going to go tight on Vince, go tight on Vince, get Vince wiping the loogie out of his eye. Vince has been in the TV business his whole life. Nothing's going to happen without his consent. Everybody knows you're leaving. You're going to stand in what's now your opposition's ring on a global broadcast, and you're going to motion the call signs of your competitor. If that's not okayed by a big boss, in my mind, they're going to cut away from that. I mean, I've never discussed it with Sean, and I wasn't there, and I didn't ask guys who were there. Watching it as an educated fan, I would say it was a complete collaboration by all parties. And that's all I got to say about that. People do say it was a work, and Brett was in on it. No, man, this is the way this piece of history went down. Conspiracy theorists will always be conspiracy theorists. But unfortunately, sometimes when people want more of a story to be there that just isn't there, they try to create it. When we did an interview with, with, with Scott Hall, he believes that the Montreal Screwjob is this very scripted sort of thing. He's not one of them too, is he? <laughs> but I'm sorry, just, it's, just, it's ludicrous that Scott Hall would say that he didn't talk to Shawn Michaels about this. I know they all talk to each other about everything, but especially about this. Why the f wouldn't they? I will tell anybody to their face that thinks that this was a work, you are a dumb, stupid These are death threats. I've gotten a bunch of them, but these were some of the most creative and, and some of the most picturesque, so I framed these. Get by the ring one more time, you make a target under those lights, you won't know where it comes from. Bye-bye. They pulled it all off because I trusted the referee. Poor Earl, he's just a little guy, I feel so bad for him, like, to, to put that on him was such a rotten thing to do. For the last 15 years, it's been the shits. There's always a champ in any arena as you screw Brett. We, we never talked for a long, long time, many years. It's, even though Brett and I are friends now, this is still upsetting. I guess you can tell I'm kind of breaking down a little bit, but it's something that will be with me forever. A lot of people will say, hey, it was their idea, all the way from Vince Russo to Jim Cornette to Triple H to Sean to me. You know, we all said it. 
The Montreal screw job is remembered all kinds of different ways by all kinds of different people. For the fans, it was like one of the first big behind the scenes things that exploded and they heard about and they realized that there was more intrigue in the locker room and in the boardroom than there sometimes was in the ring. As soon as you start doing that, as soon as you don't believe it's real anymore, it's not really worth watching. That's the way that people feel when they lose faith in their hero. That's when you lose people in wrestling because they believed in the people involved, even if they didn't always believe all the action, they believed in the people. I take a lot of pride, almost uh, ridiculous pride in um, being the wrestler that I was. I believe that I was the guy that reinforced wrestling aspect of, of the wrestling show. And that's what I like to be remembered for. The reality of the situation is, is that if two guys just could have, you know, could have got over themselves, well, we wouldn't be sitting here today. I mean, any final thoughts on, like, Jim? I've ignored him for years, and it's on and on. It's my, my personal enjoyment at this advanced age to remind everybody at every opportunity that he's a liar. It's freaking wrestling. It means nothing. I will live to piss on his grave. Even if I'm in a walker, my wife already has instructions, she's out of the will. If she doesn't get me there, if I'm not ambulatory, I'll find Vince Russo's grave and I will piss on it and there will be a picture of that hanging on my wall when I pass away. And hate is a hell of a motivator. Well, there you have it, guys. Awesome episode. We're back at the table. Let's talk about Scott Hall. He has a theory here that perhaps the Montreal screw job was a work. What'd you make of that? Well, I think it's definitely entertaining, but also confounding, because I have no idea how, knowing Shawn Michaels as intimately as he does and what we know now about the screw job, that he could believe that. But the origins of that is pretty interesting. Yeah, a few years ago, Evan and I were at a film festival and they were premiering uh, the, the documentary of Resurrection of Jake the Snake Roberts. And so we went to that screening. Afterwards, we had heard rumblings that they were gonna be watching the Royal Rumble that was uh, on pay-per-view that night in their condo. And they were gonna have a couple people come over and hang out and watch it with them. So we called in some favors with some friends and they got us in there. And so we show up in our Zubas, and we're hanging out with Jake and Scott. While the pay-per-view is playing, they're just sitting around telling stories. And someone says, Scott, what do you think of the Montreal screw job? And he just goes, total work. <laughs> and we're like, what? You think this is a work? Well, you know, the, the whole trick of the wrestling business is uh, to make people believe. And when you just look at the results, even though Brett's career may not have went the way he hoped in WCW, Everyone made more money as a result of this, right. which does lend itself to conspiracy theorists. Uh, such a fascinating story. The conversation will continue. After the break, we'll be back with more conversation here at the table, answering more unanswered questions and hearing a new perspective you've never heard before. Julie Hart, Brett's wife at the time, and we're gonna hear from her next. Back to the table here on Dark Side of the Ring Confidential. How's it going, guys? Good, going good, man. We've just watched the Montreal screw job. There's a lot to unpack from this episode, but we'll just dive right in. What's the legacy of the screw job? I think the legacy of the screw job is it's, it's going to stand as one of the most pivotal moments in wrestling history. If this were to happen today, I don't think it would mean nearly as much. Like, right. I don't think people would, frankly, give a shit. Because at this point in time in wrestling, like, it's still protected a little bit. They're still not trying to get the secrets of wrestling out. They're protecting it because without that, this doesn't really mean as much. It's kind of right on the edge of when wrestling would just become like more widely acceptable as a work, you know, even from the company's point of view. The world title meant something so much more. I mean, Brett takes it that seriously. The company takes it that seriously. So this whole situation wouldn't happen. Today, they're just throwing belts around like it's, you know, crazy. Yeah, people don't debate matches today like they did back then. And the Montreal Screwjob is debated every time the anniversary comes up every year. And it'll continue to happen for generations, who knows, maybe hundreds of years from now. We've talked a lot about Vince McMahon in this episode. Obviously, he's not gonna take part in the Dark Side of the Ring interview, but if you guys were lucky enough to pin him down, what would your one question about the Screwjob to Vince McMahon be? I would ask him if he could settle the debate as to who pitched him 
the idea to do the screw job? Was it Vince Russo or was it Jim Cornette? Or what's the thought process? Like at one point, were you really trying to find a solution? And then at one point, you know, did you decide, okay, we're gonna do this? You didn't honor Brett's contract. Right. And yet, just a few months later, you're gonna dole out a bunch of cash for Mike Tyson to have a few appearances. So what was the thinking there? Well, one person we haven't heard from yet is Brett's wife at the time, Julie Hart. And I was fascinated to hear that you guys actually sat down with her for season three. Uh, how did you get her to open up and talk about the screw job? It's funny because we interviewed Julie Hart for our upcoming Dynamite Kid episode. And Jason and I are always fascinated with the perspectives of spouses of wrestling. They're the ones that always have to deal with all the bullshit. They have no facade to maintain, right? So with Julie, we were interested to get that perspective. I remember at the very end, I was like, and just one more question. You know, uh, you were there for the Montreal screw job. And she's like, no, Evan, don't do it. Don't go there. Well, I'm excited oh. to see the clip. She was backstage <laughs> that night. Here she is, uh... Julie Hart. Well, I mean, it obviously changed everything for not only Brett, but wrestling, myself. It was a game changer, that's for sure. We didn't expect that to happen, really. Brett was going into his depression, I was going into my depression, and things weren't even really good for us at the time anyway. I have lots of ideas about wrestling with shadows. <laughs> Unfolding, like what was going through your mind at the time? Oh, I was like, holy cow, he really did. He did it. He really pulled the fast one. Wow, powerful stuff. I mean, you get to see not only what we saw on camera, but the depression that followed. Julie can speak to that, right? I think the final nail in the coffin for any conspiracy theory is that Brett didn't prosper in this at all. Brett was depressed. You know, he went to WCW, he was underutilized. I think that's kind of the final nail in the coffin there. Last question, fellas. What was your overall experience and takeaway from working on the Montreal screw job? I think for me, like, you know, it, it was challenging because this is a, a story that's been talked about so much and there is screw job fatigue. And I think it also was the first time where when this episode aired, like immediately all these screw job historians and scholars were picking apart everything. Yeah, I think that was very eye-opening for us and our crew. The wrestling fan base and all the wrestling historians will really pick apart everything you do. As filmmakers, like, our approach is never to, like, you know, list a Wikipedia entry of facts and just, like, you know, because that would be just boring, quite frankly. And wrestling fans, I think, expect that a lot. The thing that we're most focused on and the thing that we're most interested in is not a retelling of the facts. It's more about the, like the emotion and you know, uh, the human drama of all this and the, sometimes the tragedy. And those are the areas that we're playing in. Well, I want to thank you guys for all of your hard work on this episode. And I want to thank everybody for watching this very special edition of Dark Side of the Ring Confidential.